Good morning. It's indeed a great pleasure to have you all joining us for the Benjamin Bailey Lecture 2021. Founded in 1817, CMS College is the oldest college in India and one of the largest colleges in Kerala state. Reverend Benjamin Bailey was the founder principal of CMS College. As the first principal of the college, he introduced modern curriculum modeled on the University of Cambridge and began English education in Kerala. He's also known as the father of Malayalam printing and book publishing by establishing CMS Press, the first printing press in Kerala. Benjamin Bailey Lecture. It's a series and was institute, instituted in 1983 to commemorate this great visionary. This lecture series have been delivered every year by eminent persons from different walks of life, from scientists to diplomats, and from administrators to academicians. These lectures provide a feast for intellectual elite of Kerala and serve to keep alive the memory of this versatile genius who set Kerala on the path of progress and development. As we have begun a new decade of advanced technology, especially in the education sector, we are indeed honored to have with us Ms. Reema Podar, an alumnus of the college and one among the top 100 Asian American Hall of Fames. We begin this Bailey Lecture 2021 with a word of prayer. I invite Reverend Jacob George, the bursar of the college, to kindly lead us in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious, loving Heavenly Father, you are our God from generation to generation. Our lives in this world is flourished because of your love and mercy. Lord, we thank you for the nature in which we live and the society that care and encourages us to discharge our duties as you have assigned for us to nurture and equip us to do our part in this world. You are providing us many people as parents, teachers, leaders, and spiritual heads. Lord, as the CMS family, while we gather today, we do remember the CMS missionaries whom you have sent to this land to lead our generations to the real truth and light. With their sacrificial life, service and witness, they became role models to us. With their contribution, they have lifted us and enabled us to be in the mainstream of the society. Among them, we especially remember the life and service of Reverend Benjamin Bailey, the founder and the first principal of CMS College, the visionary leader through whom you have initiated a revolution in the field of education by opening a door to all to study and flourish. While we have passed the milestone of 200 years, Lord, help us to keep the vision and mission of the founders. We pray for the alumni, teachers, non-teaching staff who rendered their service in the course of this time. Especially, we thank you, Lord, for Rima Padar, the blessed personality, and our alumni, who is the main speaker for the day. Lord, we pray for the new manager, our Bishop Malil Sabu Koshicharian, and we thank you for the great leadership. We pray for the principal, staff, and students. Bless each and every one, Lord. Let the thought that shared by your daughter today may inspire, encourage, and equip us in building our society in a more effective manner. We ask this 
in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Achan. Dr. Vergis C. Joshua, the principal of the college, a noted academician and honored for his administrative capabilities, holds the Bailey Lecture closest to his heart. May I call upon you, respected sir, to welcome the gathering. Chairman of today's function, respected Right Reverend Dr. Malil Sabu Koshi Cheryan, Bishop of CSA Madhya Diocese, and the manager of CMS College. Mrs. Rima Poda, the speaker of the 28th Benjamin Bailey Memorial Lecture, 2020-21. Reverend Jacob George, Bursar of CMS College. Dr. Mini Chako, Vice Principal. Dr. Joji John Panikar, Director of IQSC and Coordinator of Benjamin Bailey Lecture of this year. Invited dignitaries who are remotely participating in this lecture. Former faculty members, former students, head of the departments, faculty members, staff, and my dear students. Good morning or good evening, wherever you are. My responsibility is to welcome you all to this year's Benjamin Bailey Memorial Talk. The Benjamin Bailey Lecture was instituted in 1983 in memory of Reverend Benjamin Bailey, the first principal of our college. And this lecture series is organized continuously as an endeavor to keep alive the memory of Right Reverend Benjamin Bailey, who had made such a significant contribution to our nation. When Benjamin Bailey with his wife arrived in this land at a very young age of 25 as the missionary of the Church Missionary Society, it was to find the people here in the oblivion of a stagnant society entangled in the toils of mindless superstition, meaningless rituals, and uh, slavery of body and spirit brought about by the absence of the right kind of education. And this young missionary felt that something must be done to free the people from these chains and bring about a true reformation in society that would ultimately lead to enlightenment, progress, and development. And he also believed that salvation means liberation from the chains of slavery and ignorance and embowment of the marginalized and the oppressed. A building society is based on freedom, justice, equality, and fraternity. He had the insight that this could be achieved only through free and liberal education, which resulted in the establishment of the Kotem College in 1817. We should also thank Reverend Benjamin Bailey every time when we read or write our language Malayalam, because it is to him that we are indebted for the typography of Malayalam. These small round types of Malayalam language were designed by Benjamin Bailey himself. All these initiatives by Reverend Benjamin Bailey caused the knowledge which had been the monopoly of the few now became the right of all. Liberal education and Western thought opened up hitherto unknown and unexplored realms of thought and made them accessible to all. Today, when I stand here as the 28th principal of CMS College in the 
fourth year, I am most certain that CMS College functions in alignment to the insights of Reverend Benjamin Bailey. Interestingly, the inaugural lecture of Benjamin Bailey series was delivered by Dr. Mitra G. Augustine, then principal of Madras Christian College. And the topic was working for change. And uh, it dealt with the autonomy in colleges, which was at that time a topic of a topic eagerly discussed in academic circles. After 38 years, we thankfully acknowledge the inputs and guidance that we received through Benjamin Bailey Memorial Lecture when we bear the title of autonomy right now. The speakers uh, came from different walks of life, from scientists to diplomats, uh, rulers, administrators, and to academics. They spoke on a variety of subjects, from autonomy to aesthetics, theoretical physics to genetics, urban planning to challenges in science and technology. Several luminaries have delivered Benjamin Bailey Memorial Lecture over the past years. Few among them are Dr. K. R. Narayanan, former president of India. He is also an alumnus of CMS College. Eminent diplomats like British High Commissioner to India, the German Ambassador to India, Nobel laureate Ishii Nageshi from Japan, Dr. E. C. G. Sudarshan, the world-renowned physicist and scientist, also an alumnus of CMS College, Dr. John P. Lee, and so on. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Mrs. Rima Podar, who is having 26 plus years of industry experience. An inductee of both top 100 Asian American Hall of Fames and top 50 most powerful women in technology in US. I think probably the only alumnus of CMS College honored by former president of US Barack Obama and also the CEO of Tesla and SpaceX Elon Musk for her innovative contributions and outstanding leadership. Today, Mrs. Rima Podar will be delivering a lecture on the power of exponentials, disruptive technologies driving the transformative future growth. The title is also very interesting. We live in incredible times. And we know that news travel the globe in an instant. Music, movies, games, communication and knowledge are ever available on always connected devices. From biotechnology to artificial intelligence, powerful technologies that were once only available to huge organizations and governments are becoming more accessible and affordable we thanks to, we thank to digitalization. The potential for entrepreneurs to disrupt industries and corporate behemoths to unexpectedly go extinct has never been greater. 100 or 50 or even 20 years ago, disruption meant coming up with a product or service that people needed but didn't have yet. And then finding a way to produce it with higher quality and lower cost than your competitors. And this entailed hiring hundreds of or even thousands of employees, having a large physical space to put them in, and even waiting years or decades for hard work to pay off and products to come to fruition. Again, thanks to digital technologies developing at exponential rate of change, the landscape of 21st century business has taken on a dramatically different look and feel. The structure of organizations is also changing. 
instead of thousands of employees and large physical plants, modern start startups are small organizations focused on information technologies. And they dematerialize what was once physical and create new products and revenue streams in months or even sometimes in weeks. It no longer takes a huge corporation to have a huge impact. And technology is disrupting traditional industrial processes and they are never going back. This disruption is filled with opportunity for forward thinking entrepreneurs. And today we will be hearing in more detail about this from Mrs. Rima Podar. Thank you, Mrs. Rima Podar, for accepting our invitation and agreeing to address us. We cannot think of a person more qualified to address this gathering. We wholeheartedly welcome you to this 28th Benjamin Bailey Memorial Lecture. Thank you. We are pleased to have Right Reverend Dr. Malil Sabu Koshi Cherian, Bishop of CSA Madhyala Diocese and Manager of CMS College as the President of today's function. Bishop, you are a special gift to our generation, a seasoned administra administrator, a humble and simple chief shepherd, source of inspiration and encouragement to many who have come your way. In a nutshell, you are a man of integrity and uh, pointing not to yourself, but beyond yourself to our Lord Jesus Christ in your teachings and uh, preachers. We are blessed to have you in our midst today. We pray that you are apostolate here in CMS College and in Madhya Diocese will continue to bear fruit for eternal life. We also pray to God to grant you good health of mind and body to bear further meaningful and effective witness to God's divine love at all times and in all places. Uh, we once again welcome you, Reverend Bishop, to this 28th Benjamin Bailey Memorial Lecture as the chairman. Let me also welcome Reverend Jacob George, Bursar of CMS College, caught him to this intellectual meeting. Ajahn, we thank you for your presence and prayer. Dr. Mini Jago, the Vice Principal, she had been of great help and support in coordinating and running the day-to-day -day activities of CMS College. Let me also extend a warm welcome to the Vice Principal. Dr. Joji John Panikar is the backbone of today's talk. He and his team are behind all the coordination and smooth execution of this virtual event. Let me use this moment to welcome Dr. Joji to this function and also to thank him and his team for their great efforts. And I think great things happen when there is a gathering of great minds. Let me welcome each and every one, every invited dignitaries and the intellectual enthusiastic who are a long-standing well-wishers of this great institution. Let me also extend a warm welcome to the former fac faculty members, former students, head of the departments, faculty members, staffs, and students of CMS College. I welcome once again and every one of you to this lecture and hope you will enjoy this event as much as we enjoyed organizing it for you. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Right Reverend Dr. Malayil Sabu Koshi Cherian, Bishop of the CSI Madhikerla Diocese, holds the office, office as the manager of CMS College. A leader with dynamism and a shepherd with vision who values the academic culture of the institution. Let me invite our beloved manager, 
for the presidential address. Greetings to you all. Dear and respected dignitaries and participants, as the manager of CMS College, I also welcome you all to this Benjamin Bailey Memorial Lecture. Especially, I welcome Mrs. Rima Fada, the member of the Board of Directors, Optimize.i. I acknowledge the presence of all the dignitaries who are attending this program through the online platform. I express my heartfelt appreciation to everyone who work hard to optimize this program, especially Dr. Vargis C. Joshua, the principal of CMS College. The Kerala Society owed to Benjamin Bailey, the first principal of CMS College, for many things. He pioneered the printing press, translation of the Bible into Malayalam, so on and so forth. The multi-factored activities of Bailey became sustained, substanti substantive and incorporatable contributions to the cultural history of Kerala. Bailey was not a mere missionary for Kerala. He was more than that for us, for our language, literature, and culture, for the people of Kottayam, and for our state, Kerala. I was really happy to know that from 1983, when the Benjamin Bailey Memorial Lecture was instituted, it has been continuing till date without a break. We are really honored to have such eminent persons to deliver the lecture over the years. This year, we are very fortunate to have Mrs. Rima Pada, a renowned leader in strategic global digital transformation. She is one of the recipients of the first Bailey Medal awarded by the CMS College. I congratulate her for all her achievements, especially for the achievement of American Hall of Fames in, 90, in 2020. The manufacturing industry, as we know, it is fundamentally changing with advanced technologies increasingly supporting global competitiveness and economic prosperity. Many leading 21st century manufacturers are converging digital and physical worlds in which sophisticated hardware combined with innovative software, sensors, and massive amounts of data and Analytic is expected to produce smarter products, more efficient processes, and more closely connected customers, suppliers, and manufacturers. Growing number of manufacturing companies look to embark on this transformative journey and navigate through a maze of challenges and opportunities. At this juncture, many questions are raised like this. What exponential technologies show the most promise? What is the magnitude of impact that can be expected from adopting and deploying these exponential technologies. How is the manufacturing industry technologies in new and distinctive ways to solve the current business issues 
and transform our future. I hope that Rima Padar will address all these issues in her lecture. I wish and pray that this Bailey lecture be fruitful for all of us and may it enhance the academic community. As I conclude my presidential address, once again, I congratulate everyone who optimize this program and may God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you, Thirimeni. Dr. Joji John Panika, the coordinator of this year's Bailey Lecture and the IQAC coordinator of the college, is an integral part who has walked many an extra mile in adding grandeur to this lecture. I call upon Dr. Joji for a note of reminiscence about Reverend Benjamin Bailey, our founder principal. Your Grace, Bishop Malail Sabu Koshicharian, President of the meeting, esteemed Ms. Rima Bodar, who delivers the Benjamin Bailey Lecture 2021, respected Principal Dr. Vergisi Joshua, respected Vice Principal Dr. Mini Chako, respected Barsar, Reverend Jacob George, acclaimed former principals and teachers of this college, principal and principals and teachers of other institutions, revered actions of neighboring churches and seminaries, members from various departments and sections of the Mahatma Gandhi University, enlightened members of the press, well-wishers of the college, dear colleagues and students, warm greetings. I've been given the responsibility of remembering the contributions of the Reverend Benjamin Bailey. Let me therefore proceed to this most pleasurable task. The name Reverend Benjamin Bailey is one that stands out with true magnificence among the many great men and women who have influenced our land and society. His half a century stint in Kerala as the missionary of the Church Missionary Society had been a truly eventful one in the cultural life of the land. It was Bailey who set the land and its people on the road to progress by throwing open a whole new world of knowledge through the works he translated or wrote in Malayalam. He made these works easily available by designing the round Malayalam types and establishing the CMS press to bring out works written in Malayalam. His flair for language allowed him to bring about a happy union of high and low Malayalam to build up a standard Malayalam prose. He translated and printed the Bible in Malayalam and thus brought the word of God within the reach of the common man. Benjamin Bailey was born in Dewsbury in Yorkshire in the last decade of the 18th century in November 1791 as the son of Joseph and Martha Bailey. Just an ordinary middle-class family which had nothing remarkable to his credit. But in the hands of God, the ordinary becomes extraordinary. Rough diamonds get cut and polished into sparkling gems. Young Benjamin answered the call of God and turned himself over at the age of 21 to the Church Missionary Society and to its dynamic secretary, Reverend Thomas Scott, to be trained into priesthood and to go unto the ends of the earth to spread the gospel. Thus, it was that young Benjamin who became the Reverend Benjamin Bailey. His first posting was in India, in the princely state of Travancore, at the behest of the resident. After an August sea voyage that lasted four months and five days, Reverend Bailey, a young man just 25 years, 
old, along with his wife Elizabeth Ella, arrived at Madras in September 1816. Another tiresome trip, this time by land, lasting nearly a month, and the Baileys finally arrived at Alipi in November. Tragedy awaited them here because Elizabeth Ella gave birth prematurely to a baby girl who lived for a mere four days. This was perhaps the Baileys' baptism by fire in a tropical country with all its attendant heat and disease. Alipi, however, was not the station intended for them. He joined Reverend Henry Baker and Reverend Joseph Fenn in Kotem. The fellowship of this Kotem trio enabled each of the trio to excel in all that they had set themselves to do. Reverend Benjamin Bailey was in charge of translating the Bible into Malayalam and having printed the same. And here begins the saga of Reverend Benjamin Bailey in Kotem. Life in Kotem was not a bed of roses for this man of God. The tropical climate of the land wrote havoc in his, on his health. He lost two of his young children to illness. They, Samuel Buckworth and Martha, lie buried in the CSI cemetery near the CMS College. The language of Malayalam was especially dear to Reverend Bailey. He mastered it with all its difficulties and standardized its prose through his translation of the Bible and other books. The very first work printed in the CMS Press was the book Cherupaidangalka Upagarartham Paribhashe Pradhiya Kathagal, which was in English. His dictionaries in English and Malayalam helped all who wished to learn the language, particularly the missionaries. Reverend Bailey's expertise in the language was acknowledged by all and highly appreciated by his fellow missionaries as expressed in their reports to the CMS. A man of many parts, the CSI Holy Trinity Cathedral Cotem, the seat of the bishop in the CSI Central Kerala Diocese, stands as a grand memorial to the architectural skill and visionary gleam of the Benjamin Bailey. One cannot but remember Reverend Bailey every time one reads a piece in Malayalam because it is to him that we are indebted for the typography of Malayalam. The small and rounded types were entirely designed by Bailey and cast in silver by a silversmith under the latter's supervision in his own house. At a time when Malayalam prose was in its infancy, it was this man of God who refined the language and brought it closer to the speech of the educated middle class rather than the extremely flowery stylistics of high Malayalam or the crude cadences of low or colloquial Malayalam. Along with his comrades, Reverend Joseph Fenn, and Reverend Henry Baker. Reverend Bailey also played his part in imparting liberal education to the young. All these events served to cause the land to shake off its lethargy and infuse new energy into all sections of the society. As Principal said in his introductory note, knowledge which had been the monopoly of the few now became the right of all. Liberal education and Western thought opened up hitherto unknown and unexplored realms of thought and made them accessible to all. When Reverend Bailey returned to England in 1850, broken in health, he left a land grieving his absence. In spite of ill health, in spite of having lost a son and two daughters to the harsh climate of the tropics, Reverend Benjamin Bailey had become greatly attached to Travancore and its people. He had built a big church for them to worship in. He had made the Bible accessible to them in their own language and printed in a press whose printer was the young Malayali whom he had groomed 
he had been with them in all times. He hated saying goodbye and so left the land where he had spent the largest part of his life in secret, making no farewells. Back in England, he did not rest on his oars but entered into parish life at Salop where he remained for the rest of his life. History has it that when he died in 1871, his groom also died unable to bear the pain of not having him anymore. All these facts were culled from the various missionary records and from the book Benjamin Bailey Memorial Lectures, a collector's treasure by Dr. Babu Cherian and Dr. Susan Vergis. In the course of history, one comes across certain personalities who are unique and beyond comparison as well as some phenomena which cannot be replicated. Reverend Benjamin Bailey is such an individual and his contributions to this land are phenomenal. The CMS College pays its homage to this great man with visionary gleam and I bow my head in reverence of this true man of God, Reverend Benjamin Bailey. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Joji. The moment we awaited has drawn nigh. Ms. Reema Podar is a strategic global digital transformational leader one among the top 50 most powerful women in technology in America, Ms. Rima has been a mentor for women engineers and technologists. A strong advocate for diversity and inclusion initiatives. The CMS College fraternity proudly invites Ms. Rima Podar to deliver the Benjamin Bailey Lecture 2021. We are living in the most extraordinary time in the history of humankind. And we have no idea how fast things are moving, changing around us. We have more access to data that you can ever imagine. With the power of technology, we are able to change the world, transform the world. We have more information, we have more resources than ever before. And if you really look at these, you wonder how the exponential growth is happening. What is the art of possibility? Like the famous innovator, entrepreneur, the futurist, and the co-founder of the Singularity University, Mr. Peter Demer, stated an I quote, the power of advanced technology is going to rise up the entire human race, not in 50, not in 40, not 30 or 20 years. We are looking at it more like in a decade. So our curiosity, the technology advancement, and the famous Moore's law is reimagining what is possible and serves as a gift that is constantly given. That's the power of exploration. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor and my pleasure to be with all of you today. I would like to take this special moment to thank 
Bishop Dr. Malil Sabu Koshi Chiryan, the Basar, Jacob John Sir, the respected principal, Dr. Vargis Chutro, Dr. Joji John Panikar, who has been the coordinator who made possible to have this event for us today, and who has been so thoughtful and connected with me to make this transition into the event such a smooth journey for me. And above all, I want to thank the organizing committee and the people who have really worked behind the scenes to make this event execute flawlessly. Let me take a moment to tell you how humbled I am to have been given this opportunity to talk to all of you. More so important for me is to my teacher, my professor, who are listening right now, and how I can share a topic that is very close to my heart with all of you. The smart generation now, the parents, the communities, the dignitary who are listening, and all my fellow alumni, and my seniors and juniors who are listening on this call. The power of exponentials. As Dr. Vargas Yoshua very well said, we are going through a phase where disruption is happening everywhere. And these technologies are driving as a focal function for the transformative future growth. So when I was a kid, I was always so excited, you know, looking forward to the release of the next new James Bond movie, the Not Not Set then. When I was in school, I would really go and wait for these releases. And we'll go, we'll ask my mom to take me and my sister, watch this movie. I was so fascinated by the technology that is being used in these movies to bring some reality, augmented reality that I didn't even know a word called that. But what really drove me into this, what these technologies that we use, the cool gadgets that's used by Not Not 7, I remember in um, License to Kill, Timothy, you know, Timothy Dow has a cool, a benign thing that he uses as a powerful explosive. I vividly remember the character Joe who had a deadly steel denture. And anything that came in front of him, he would just stop it, whether it's steel, sharp, whatever that is. In Tomorrow Never Die, Pierce Brosnan uses an Ericsson mobile phone as a remote to start us BMW car, which is very cool. And the coolest part of all that of the full mobile device was used as a fingerprint scanner, a lockpick, and whatnot. And the one more cool thing to totally remember in Pierce Boss movie, Die Another Day, was this the smart, sexy Ashton Martin car suddenly becomes invisible by a press of a button and an invisible cloak just you know, surrounds it. What a cool way of portraying some of the technology we didn't even experience at that point, you know? The images are awed by the characters of these movies, how they use technology to portray what's coming and makes you think what's coming in the future. Fast forward, many of you might have heard the movie. This was released in 1999, Matrix, where the cool, innovative AI technology shows its art of good and evil in the science fiction matrix, a Neo character is always wondering whether am I really living in the reality or in a simulated world? Wow, technology 
is an awesome way of teaching us so many different creativity around us. So let's take a look back. Let's go through the journey of industrial revolution. The first industrial revolution happened in the 18th and 19th century in Europe, where steam engines were invented. The second industrial revolution happened in 1870s, 19, early 90s, where we saw steel, oil, electricity, combustion engines. The third, the big industrial revolution that I can relate to, 1980, personal computers were give, gave birth. The internet came in, the World Wide Web that connected us. We could start looking at information, the intranet, the internet, the birth, the explosion of internet era. The fourth industrial revolution, the early 21st century, we started hearing the chapter of big data, analytics, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, in the industrial internet, internet of things, edge compute, connected devices, and the list just goes on. The fifth industrial revolution that we are living, going through is today. It's all about how you're bringing this converging frontier technologies that's used to purpose and inclusivity. If you really think about it, the pandemic that we all went through, we are going through, we all have witnessed that the acceleration of digital transformation didn't have, you know, or didn't go in just one or two year steps. It's been happening or it's actually accelerated by 10 folds. So with this fifth industrial revolution, we can certainly say that we are not going to see the transformation of 100 years in this way. We are going to see more like a 20,000 years of transformation at today. That's the power of exponential. So what does exponential growth feel like? Dr. Rogi Joshua mentioned about it. You know, we now can get the news instantly. I can listen to music, game, communication. I can chat with my friends. I can have a real video conference. Everything is connected. We are on the connected spectrum network. If there is a match going on, I can say that or debate with my friend and say it was not the right play. I can argue and say that the empire did not make that call right. Everything in real time. See, feel, touch. Everything. That is the power of exponential. That's what we are going through. So, Peter Diamandis, the futurist, the person who I really follow and I'm awed by his thought process, defines this growth phase in six key steps. And he calls this as the six Ds. Digitized. So what does that mean? Digitized is anything that you can digitally transfer, that is, make it as a digital asset by zeros and ones, you know? That means music, the movie, the documents that we can all share, access, store. That is, that is digitization, that's happening right now. But the thing with the next phase is called deception. And the reason why we call that is, whenever we have an exponential growth, the early phases of any digital information, we experience that or we realize that only really slowly. So think about it in a mathematical way. 0 0.01, you double it, it's 0 0.02. Then it becomes 0 0.04. And it really doesn't exponentially start off until it breaks that the whole number barrier. So now, if you're thinking about two as an exponential, two becomes 32, 32 becomes 32,000 in smooth ways, quickly. 
And that is exponential. And then you start seeing the peak of exponential curve. That's the deceptive phase. So initially you don't feel it, but suddenly it hits you then it takes an exponential curve. Disruptive is the next stage. We are all going through that right now. What is happening is the products and the services that we offer to us has changed, disrupted through technology and digitalization. Why do you want to go and buy a CD when I can listen to music, when I can stream music through an app, Spotify, GeoSavin, Ghana, YouTube Music? Why buy, go and buy a camera when I can shoot, store, share my pictures? The next phase is dematerialization or the dematerializing that is happening. What does it mean? That means starting to take physical devices out of the equation. Something that was bulky, costly, is slowly getting replaced by black. Like the radio, like the tape recorder, like the video recorder, like physical maps that we use to really see where to go, how long will it distance still from point two to Anglo, let's say. Everything is now available as digital asset in a simple smartphone that is so thin and that can be easily put in your pocket. That's the power of exponential. The next phase, demonetization of the happening is how slowly as technology is getting cheaper, as devices become smaller, the technology is really creating much more thinner materials, you know, money is slowly taken out of the equation. And now we can download thousands of apps on your mobile device, almost at no cost, zero cost. And through those apps, I can actually tap into or use terabytes of information. The next phase, that's called the democratizing. That phase means anything that is not applicable to us. Like the cool technologies that we were talking about, AI, the biotechnology, that was only available to government, that was only available to big organizations, is now completely accessible to almost everyone. So as technology advances, it creates a cheaper solution. The accessibility is given to everyone, users like you and me. So what are those signs and technology that really help the culture growth? Dr. Malay, um, as Abhijarian sir, did talk about this, that how the manufacturing industry is transforming, how safety and metals are looked in a different way. Let's take a moment to really look at all these technologies. But before that, I want you all to just look through this technologies that's causing this exponential growth in this era. Sensors, networks, communication from 2G to 4 to 5G, artificial intelligence, robotics is maturing, 3D printing, which is another word called additive manufacturing, where you can actually create 3D components using the CAD model. And the best thing about this is you are going to build this 3D component using less material than the traditional manufacturing methods. We're looking at virtual reality. We're looking at augmented reality. We're looking at synthetic biology. That's really helping us, you know, replace our vital organ for survival, for living life where we're getting synthetic heart getting built and replaced. 
all these opportunities, all these technologies are actually reinventing every business model and ecosystem. Amazing. Let's just take a listen to this simple video that I would like you to watch. Alexa, play classical music. Well, my name is Jerry Reese. I'm 70 years old. I live in an active adult community for people of 55 and over here in San Jose, California. I actually have uh, five desktops, four laptops, two Kindles, and uh, an iPad. Uh, I have Amazon Alexa. I've had her for a couple of years now. And as someone that didn't even see my first television until I was seven years old, I can tell you that the evolution of technology is inevitable. It benefits mankind. To see the stars in the Milky Way, I actually spend all day under here. Artificial intelligence is all around us. And we use it in different ways every day. You wake up, you go for a run, your watch tracks where you're going, measures your heart rate variability, using forms of AI. The AI was used by a farmer to grow the crops, the strawberries and the blueberries that I had for breakfast. Maybe we're in a car that has AI that helps send the other vehicles on the road around. You sit down at your computer, you start to email. It's all filtered by AI. Then you take a photograph. The tools that help you support the photograph are AI too. Artificial intelligence is everywhere. It's becoming ever more prevalent in our lives. What is the temperature in San Jose, California? AI and machine learning are the biggest revolution today. And this is the order of the agricultural industrial revolution in the past. I think technology is going to have a really hard time helping people like me. There's a lot of hype. as well. One of the great things about machine learning is how it's been democratized. This whole huge jump. And all of a sudden you're getting confronted with the fact that I might not be driving a car in the next 10 years. Because it's software, the rate changed so much faster. This technology will be created. We have no escape from it now. People may think AI is going to take over the world. They're definitely nervous. All of those dystopian things that we might think, oh, that could never happen, might actually happen. So we have not what's going to happen to us, but what's possible to happen with us. And where can we go? It's sort of unlimited. You know what I loved about that video, apart from all the cool technologies and what's bringing reality, was that the lady who said that we shouldn't be worried about what's going to happen to us. What we have to do is what can we do along? with the technology, how do we do it together? So AI, a cool new technology that you're hearing all around. But let me take a moment to tell you that there is no AI without data. And we all know and we all realize that data is every The digital data that exists today, the data that we create, is exponentially growing. And statistics say that this year, which is 2021, it's going to generate 74 zettabytes. Yes, zettabytes of data. And they are saying that this will double by 2024. The volume of data that is collected essentially the volume of data that we are having right now. We will wonder what are we doing with these data? The famous British mathematician and entrepreneur, Calvin Robert Humvee, coined this phrase, data is the new oil. I can closely relate to it. Just like oil, so precious and it still is 
But what did we do? We decimated the oil and we got gas after that. We got plastics, chemicals, all these things that we generated from it. It's all the equation to profitability and the activities that we can play. Just like that, what he's saying is data has to be divided and condensed into different parts and different methods and analyzed to draw means insights. I call this as data monetization. And AI really uses these technologies, right? These kind of analysis, scoring, the recording of data. But there is a problem. The decision maker who has to make decision looking at this airball of data, the big data, spends 90% of the time sifting to these data to find outliers. It's an audio. Believe having done it, I know. And I can tell you there might be some data scientists, data engineers, data analysts, or somebody who has a mindset of statistical modeling and maths can closely relate to what I'm saying. So what would you do? What is that art of the science that helps us look at these outliers? Can tell you what's the difference between a signal versus the sound or a noise. And that is data science. So data science, is, as it's still, it is the science of data. It is used to score, store, advise, and record. And the goal of data science is to actually drive the value out of these anomalies and insights and use that for and inform decision making. And that is the art of the possible the science that we are dealing with in every aspect of our life technology. So when I was growing up and when I did my master's in physics and my computers, that was the internet era. Everybody was actually wanting to be a computer engineer, me, myself wanted to be a doctor became a computer engineer and i'm so glad i did that but now it's all about data science so what are the disciplines that is related to data science or the career opportunities it's data scientists data analysts big data specialists data engineer so with the progress of data science, the progress of automation, now we are giving the decision makers an algorithm app that clearly can outlate signals and noise so that the decision maker can just focus on the right data to make meaningful information and value with life. What a nice way of marriage to the scientist's data anomaly detection is not. That's again how industry is transforming, the point is transforming, and actually more valuable. So, what is artificial intelligence? AI, we figured out by now, right? AI is not the only data. Data is the part of it. But what is artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence is the technique which enables machines to mimic human behavior. So, you might have heard about artificial intelligence used in conjunction with machine learning and deep learning. All these, right? It all was being used together. To simply put, artificial intelligence is the tool set of machine learning and deep learning. Machine learning it's actually, as I mentioned, is a subset of AI and which, is, which uses statistical methods to analyze, to enable machine to improve with experience. 
it really make machine more intelligent by providing more data to it, more algorithms, more subsets of data, structured, unstructured, whatnot. And deep learning on the other side, which is a subset of the machine learning, actually uses computation of multi-layered neural network, and it makes it possible and feasible. So what are some of the examples um, that where machine learning is leveraged and where machine learning is really helping us diagnose patients, diseases proactively and helping them. It really detects fraudulent activity in manufacturing. It really helps you to prevent failures from happening, big equipment failures. I have, I can personally share a story with you. Back in the days when I was in GP and I was leading the whole technology division for the one of the innovative products in which I consider myself to be really fortunate to have gotten that opportunity to develop, lead and commercially deliver. That application was called as the Asset Performance Management SaaS application. What is that used for? That's used to really you anomaly detect it, to understand if there is a failure, if there is something causing a problem in the health of the machine. And our job, the, the job for the SaaS application was to really detect through data, through anomaly raw insight and provide analytics and alerts to the recipient, maybe the consumers and the customers to say that potentially a failure is going to happen in the next two months because there is a small crack in the engine. Think about the scenario, the same application is really used by aviation industry. The criticality, I can only tell you it's profound. Because now we are looking at the data, the sensors of the jet engines are transmitting. When it takes off, it cruises, and then it lands. What we are really monitoring is the health of the engine. And what's our ultimate goal? To move people like you and me safely from one point to the other. Look at the power of technology. Look at how you can predict proactively from any failure that's going to happen. That's one. With the data in the past, you can actually predict model, create models, and predict the future. That we call it as the prescriptive analytics, where you are not only telling what is going to happen, but you're going to say, how can you solve? And there are two possibilities in which you can solve this. That's amazing. Let me share another story that I was part of. So in my days in Teradata as the chief product officer of the technology and the product teams, in 2018, late between early 2019, I live in California. And California, summer, it's a beautiful place. But summer, we get brush fires because of the crouching heat. Uh, the grass is dry, brush fire happens. Sometimes it is also human prone ignorance through campfires. So what happened was there were huge disastrous California dry fire happening near Sacramento and Los Angeles area. And there were 8,000 firefighters that were deployed, who were you know, trying to really put the fire off, which is raging fire. Now think about all these people, the first responders, the fire, you know, firefighters, their safety is also very important. Now what happened was T-Mobile, one of our customers, was the world's, one of the world's largest metro provider and obviously wireless and provider, who's a subset, who's actually a subsidiary of Deutsche Telekom. The technology executives, uh, executives found out that you know, many of their subscribers were actually in California when, they, when that disaster happened. 
And I'm talking about these subscribers not living in California. They are actually in summer. So they are actually visiting their cousins, their grandkids, their family from East Coast, West Coast. They've come here. The, there was network disruption. And there is a total panic that happened across the board where loved ones are not, not able to reach each other. They are not able to find if they are in a safe feature zone. Have they been relocated from that disaster zone? Think about the intensity of the problem. We worked so closely with the T-Mobile Analytics Group and my team, the data and engineers and data analysts, quickly worked together to really use ML, machine learning, and geospatial coordinates to really locate by pinging the phones and the geospatial location to identify folks in that area. And what we went one step forward, created a service network that we could open up channel to, so that everybody could actually communicate, they could talk about their well-being, are they safe, and you know, give that warmth and comfort to their loved ones. Think about that opportunity you get through technology to touch, to change the world, to make sure people are safe. That's happening. This is just an example, right? Then I get far more. There are so many things that's going on around the world. So neural network, we did talk about deep learning at that point in time and how it uses that multi-layer neural network. What I want to actually have you take a listen is that the young generation, the curious minds, how are they learning about neural network? Take a listen. <laughs> Knowing what a network is is very important for us to understand artificial intelligences because artificial intelligence is based on connections, making connections. We're going to start off playing. Say something about yourself. So, for example, I can say I live in Queens. So, if anybody else lives in Queens, I want you to raise your hand, and I'm going to pass this thing along to you. Now, the key thing that you guys got to remember is that we cannot let go of the string. Okay? We will have cats. Who has cats? <laughs> So a neural network is a form of artificial intelligence that's been designed very specifically based on neuroscience and based on our best understanding of how the human brain works. As you learn, our brain models are what we call the snap strength, which is the interconnection between two processing units. The neural network is the same thing. The neural network actually starts out where you're defining these little layers. Convolutional 2D, convolutional 2D, linear, linear, linear. These are types of layers that you, you get in these small networks. And then you hook them all together. <laughs> you say this layer connects to this layer. I like hot dogs. Anybody else like hot dogs? I like hot dogs. You say this one talks to that, the next one, the next one talks to that one. And once you've done it, you've built the neural net. So what do you guys notice forming between us? I formed the bridge to her, but there's connections in between us. Like I like that. There's connections in between us. Does everyone here have a connection with each other? Knowing those similarities and voicing them helps us create a network between us. The same way the neural network. How Computer, things, connections, and so you saw how the creative mind today is using simple tools and simple techniques and simple examples to realize what neural network is. So here is the example for deep learning. You know, we all know image recognition. Many of us have iPhones. I use my facial recognition to unlock my iPhone. There is natural language processing called the NLP that is widely used right now to do sentiment analysis. You call 
there is a service provider that you used and you're not happy about him or her or the provider. So you quickly pick up the phone, you speak. The first person you're actually speaking to actually is a chatbot nowadays, right? You're not really connected uh, to the actual person. Once you get through to the actual person at the call center, A, you're having a waiting time for that bother. So it looks like your mood is not really good at this point in time. The technology picks up your sentiment with the voice. And then it actually communicates to the call center customer or the person who's actually talking to you and tells that your customer is not happy about how you're taking this forward. So maybe you could actually provide this offer or that offer to make him or her happy. I call this a total experience. It's all about how do you create that experience, use experience, total experience, the experience that you feel happy about your consumer and your customer. It is all how you really retain your customers. There is speech recognition. Any of you might have Google, Alexa, or more just the Apple phone. I keep asking you, hey Siri, what's the weather today? And the wake world actually makes Siri or Alexa wake up. And that world is used and transmitted so quickly to going through the hubs of data to get this data back into and given us that information. Take it one step further. We're using that voice recognition to turn off and turn, turn off our lights these days, smart homes, smart devices, smart manufacturing units, smart factory flows. We are using that technique to make sure that energy is not utilized at the time when there is nobody in that particular office or in the house. It's all about sustainability. And it's all about how technology is helping you to create a sustainable future. So now I'm going to share a little bit of a real world example that is used in conjunction with the Google scientists or engineers. And this is a particular video that was shared with the Northwestern University researchers. Take a listen. Breast cancer is most commonly found on a mammogram. Mammograms, unfortunately, like most diagnostic tests, are not perfect and can't always catch the cancer. In fact, up to one in five women can have their cancer missed on a mammogram. There are two main challenges with diagnosing uh, breast cancer with a mammogram. The first is the false negative of missing cancer. There's the other side of the equation, which is called positive, which means we think they have cancer when they don't actually have cancer. Computers learn a lot like humans, they look at my example. And in order to teach a computer how to interpret mammograms, we had to show it many, many examples, those that contain cancer and those that don't. When we supervise it and we say, uh, these are the cases that are positive and these are the cases that are negative. And after many, many iterations and showing them and through trial and error, it will eventually learn to get things right. We had six radiologists look at all these cases and decide whether they thought cancer was present or not. We had the algorithm do the same task, it did much better. The most exciting part of this work is that we're able to catch 9% more cancer at screening. Also very exciting is that we're able to reduce the amount of false positives by 5 points. So, with new power comes new responsibility. Let's take AI as an example itself, right? AI is a technology that can be used for good things and totally bad things. So how do we make sure that the government are going to use the AI technology for the safety of the humankind, right? So just like what pharmaceutical industries, we trust the pharmaceutical industries, we don't question them these days about, okay, what's the proportion of medication, the chemicals that going into this particular tablet. 
That's because there is a rule, there is a process proof, there is a guidance, there is a protocol, there is a standard that's been defined. And you have to abide by these standards and governance. Just like that, AI has a framework of governance where you define the ethics, the integrity, the transparency, the accountability, the standards that one needs to follow for the better goodness society. So, as I mentioned, with the accountability, transparency, the privacy and the security that plays a huge role because data, our data, now is in the hands of men. How do you know that it's not getting misused? In California, there was a law passed in favor of the citizens of California, where we actually can go to big organization, any organization for that matter, and ask them, how is my data getting generated? How are you using it? And we can even go one step further and say that you cannot use my data or you cannot sell my data. So that is happening. And as we speak, every country we have to have that governance in place because i i think everybody will be tempted to use the power of ai and the technology and if there is no governance and framework for it that's not going to help the human kind at all so this particular quote by tim cook the ceo of apple clearly resonates with me what all of us have to do is to make sure we are using AI in a way that is for the benefit of the humanity, not to the detriment of humanity. So well said. And AI governance in the framework is going to, and we have to, put it as a standard to make it happen. So a little bit of food of thought for all of you. So what happens if the robot stop thinking like us, thinking smoothly? So February of 2021, this year, there was a group of scientists and researchers from Robot University who created or found or gave birth to a material which can be, which can think like a human cell and absorb information like a human cell. So now, it is possible, part of possible, that the, robot, the robots can start thinking like humans. Again, you have to go by the governments to make sure the robots doesn't become the super robots with all the collective human brains that we have on the earth. I'm enthusiastic and optimistic about our future. With the right technology, we will and we can give paths to a brighter, better future. But not just for us, but for the future generation to come. Thank you. This day has proved to us and all around that science is art in it and technology has poetry flowing out of it. Thank you so much, ma'am, for that wonderful presentation and getting us all connected to it. Thank you. Dr. Mini Chako, an epitome of the strength of silence and significance of sincerity now holds the office as a vice principal and controller of examinations of the college. May I request you, ma'am, to propose a vote of thanks. Distinguished dignitaries, dear colleagues, students, friends, and well-wishers of CMS College. This year's 
Reverend Benjamin Bailey Memorial Lecture is being hosted at a time when the education system is at crossroads. Yet, CMS College moves on in the right direction under the able leadership of Right Reverend Dr. Malayil Sabu Koshi Cheryan, the manager, and Dr. Varghese Joshua, our principal. On a formal note, I take this opportunity to thank Tirimini for his spiritual guidance and Joshua sir for his timely interventions while steering the college towards their common goal. Ever since the inception of the Bailey Memorial Lectures in 1983, it has remained an integral part of the CMS College culture, looked forward by one and all, especially the intellectual elite of Cotem. The college then used to be in a week to two week long mode of preparations and celebration. However, the new normal way of life has on one hand forced us to forego, forego the celebrations but on the other has opened up possibilities to identify and invite social transformers of the stature of Reverend Benjamin Bailey to deliver the Bailey Memorial Lecture. We were fortunate to have with us today Ms. Reema Podar, a multifaceted personality, passionate leader, innovative change maker, mentor, social transformer, and philanthropist. On behalf of the CMS College family, I express our love to you, our alumnus, and thank you, madam, for the very informative talk and putting across lucidly the power of exponentials which will drive our future growth. I thank Reverend Jacob George for his prayerful blessings, Dr. Joji John Paniker, IQAC Director, for efficiently coordinating the Bailey Memorial Lecture, Dr. Susan Matthew for beautifully comparing the program, Midun Mohan and his team for technical support, and all of you listening to me for, the, for your presence. Thank you all once again. Every Bailey Lecture is an event singled out for its uniqueness, noted for its quality, and significant for the resource person. CMS College's faith and trust in ourselves in this respect is more than, is more than cemented this year through Ms. Reema Podar. Thank you once again for being a part of this auspicious day. Thank you. <laughs>